As David said, my name is Chelsea Parker and I'm a PhD candidate at um, Brown University. And so today I'm going to talk to you about some of our most recent work um, for the final chapter of my dissertation on looking at the response of case study tropical cyclones um, and the, the response of their characteristics to projected climate change forcing in northeastern Australia. Uh, I do want to caveat uh, straight off that I don't uh, classify myself directly as a computational scientist, but I hope that this will be of interest to this uh, diverse audience. So I just want to start out um, with some acknowledgements. Uh, so to my department um, at Brown and also the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society, both of which um, support this work in a number of ways. Um, and my advisor, Amanda Lynch, who was just mentioned, um, who many of you may know. Um, but also the National Center of Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, which I'll mention a lot in this talk. Um, a lot of this work is in collaboration with them, particularly the regional climate group, uh, specifically there, Cindy Brewer, James Doe, and Priscilla Rooney. Also, I have to thank the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, particularly Noel Davidson, who provides a lot of data um, which facilitates my research. Um, so here's a brief outline of what I'm going to cover today. I'll start with a fairly uh, broad, uh, basic introduction of tropical cyclones, uh, reef environments, and their interactions. Um, this is to get us all on the same page, but also provides um, a really good background for the motivation of my research. Um, I'll then go over the methodologies I use specifically uh, for the results that I'll sh share with you today. Um, I'll touch on some computational aspects which might be of interest, um, give you some highlights of the results, uh, particularly in terms of looking at the characteristics of tropical cyclones such as intensity, size, uh, trajectory, precipitation, and how they respond to climate change forcing. And end with some conclusions and the implications that uh, my findings might suggest. Um, I think we're having a little bit of resolution um, struggle, so I'll do my best to explain anything that might not be shown too clearly. Um, so we'll start with a fairly basic um, idealized diagram, a cross section through a tropical cyclone. Um, so as you might be aware, tropical cyclones are very large, low pressure systems. Um, they're characterized by highly organized convection cells, uh, which have updrafts and downdrafts. Um, and these convection bands are associated with heavy rainfall. The heaviest rainfall typically tends to be um, in the eye wall uh, convection band, so either side of the eye. Uh, the eye is a distinct area. Um, it's usually cloudless, and which is due to strong subsidence in the center of the cyclone. Um, cyclones have strong cyclonic winds near the surface, um, which act as you know, a highly damaging uh, force. But as a tropical cyclone uh, tracks um, geographically across um, ocean and land, uh, the forward motion of a tropical cyclone uh, gets added to the cyclonic wind, so the wind speed experienced on the surface can actually be stronger given that motion. So they take form in a continuous process which spans several days, um, usually from a pre-existing low or a disturbance. And so in order for the disturbance to become a full tropical cyclone, uh, you need a number of conditions um, in the environment. So you need instability in the atmosphere, uh, moisture in the middle troposphere, uh, low vertical wind shear, which is very important for allowing um, those uh, convective structures to remain intact and not to get, um, I guess, physically ripped apart. So it needs to maintain its structure. You need warm sea surface temperatures of 26 and a half degrees C um, in, on the ocean surface, but up to 60 meters depth beneath the surface. And this sea surface temperature is very important for fueling uh, the latent heat exchange in a tropical cyclone. And they also have to be at least uh, 500 kilometers away from the equator um, in order for Coriolis to have um, an effect for the tropical cyclone to spin. So here are the global locations where uh, those conditions that I've just described exist and where tropical cyclones exist. Um, so here we're looking at a composite of all um, tropical cyclones recorded in a 20 year period um, globally. So the dots, well, roughly the lines um, represent the trajectories. 
the colors are representing intensity, uh, blue colors are weaker, yellow to red colors are stronger uh, cyclones. Um, so in, in this uh, slide, we're seeing that same composite of tropical cyclones uh, globally and where they exist. But now on the bottom, we're actually looking at the global location of um, coral reef environments. And I want you to um, compare the two. And although um, the geographic location is not exactly one-to-one, -one, there is a substantial overlap, especially in the Caribbean region, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, parts of the Indian Ocean, and um, noticeably also Northern Australia, and importantly, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, um, which is a primary area of interest in our work. So reef ecosystems are subject to many uh, global stresses, uh, particularly ocean warming and ocean acidification, uh, which result in uh, dissolution of reef environments, but also uh, coral bleaching. And these are known or have been noted to in be increasing with climate change. And indeed, um, the Great Barrier Reef has been suffering from a very extreme, um, possibly the most extreme coral bleaching event that's been on record, uh, which has captured a lot of media attention, and I'm sure you're aware of it. Um, but local and more natural disturbances, such as tropical cyclones, can also have a large host of negative um, impacts and consequences to reef environments. Uh, these include uh, physical breakage of corals and also reduced water quality. And these tend to compound um, reef ecosystems that are already uh, weakened by global stresses and the compounding effects of all of these negative um, impacts often lead to um, lowered coral reef resilience to any future disturbances and um, often uh, ecosystems that can't provide their functions anymore, which is important for biodiversity, but also for coastal communities which rely on them. So explicitly, there are a number of ways in which tropical cyclones um, negatively affect reef environments. So first of all, wind and wave action um, creates a kinetic energy which can cause mechanical damage, so it physically breaks coral assemblages. You also have a large amount of mixing and rainfall that falls on the surface of the ocean, uh, both of which can reduce temperature and salinity. And this can actually um, uh, be a negative effect for organisms that are highly adapted to certain salinity, certain temperatures. You also have heavy rainfall and storm surge um, that floods coastal lands and receding flood water brings with it large amounts of nutrients and sediments um, and in those concentrations they can act as pollutants to the reef environment but also incite um, algal blooms uh, which actually outcompete um, benthic reef organisms. So it is thought that um, tropical cyclones will be sensitive to climate change. Uh, they may become more intense. They may be associated with more extreme and intense rainfall in the future. Um, those sorts of changes to their characteristics will, uh, it's thought to be uh, increase in those negative interactions with reef environments. And so reef environments will be further uh, stressed and have reduced resilience to disturbance. But the exact way in which tropical cyclone characteristics will change uh, with climate change um, is really the focus of our research. Um, and it will give us an indication of what uh, might then uh, happen to the reef environment. And we're particularly interested in how tropical cyclones that affect the Great Barrier Reef uh, may expect to change with um, climate change forcing. So here's the Great Barrier Reef outlined um, in red. Um, it is the largest reef ecosystem on the planet. Um, might not be able to see too clearly, but overlain are category four and five, so very intense tropical cyclones that have crossed and interacted with the Great Barrier Reef from 2005 to 2010. So what we're seeing is the trajectory, but then also the extent of the destructive winds. Um, so you see there is, in fact, a great deal of interaction, even over a five-year period, between these two phenomena. 
um, but the exact area of the reef and the extent of the reef that is affected by any one storm is highly dependent on track. So whether it just um, crosses or uh, tracks quite along um, the Great Barrier Reef. So it's dependent on track, uh, size and intensity of the system. It has also been mapped that these same um, intense tropical cyclones have been associated with flood plumes. So that's that light red shaded area just along the coastline, if you, if you can see beneath. Um, so intense events have been associated with um, quite intense and extensive flood plumes into the reef environment. Um, so we're interested in taking a few of these types of events and seeing what they might look like in the future climate. So I just want to give a note about simulating tropical cyclones. Um, in large uh, global general circulation models, GCMs, they are able to simulate uh, tropical cyclone-like vortices um, and capture things like overall frequency um, and characteristics in a season, such as number of tropical cyclones and how they compare. But they don't capture, um, GCMs don't capture details of tropical cyclone characteristics, um, such as the detailed structure, intensity, um, and some of the other characteristics that we're particularly interested in. They also don't um, replicate exact case studies um, or exact events. Um, you just kind of get a, something that looks like a tropical cyclone vortex. Um, so with increased resolution in the future, GCMs will be able to achieve this. But at present, um, with the current tools that we have, we're opting to use a limited area high resolution model and a case study approach in order to um, address uh, the issues that we're interested in. So uh, this case study approach, we've chosen three tropical cyclones, uh, the three most recent intense events to have affected the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so what we're seeing here is the observed trajectory of the cases um, and the markers are colored by intensity. So black and blue is weaker and, and getting more intense to the warmer red and purple colors. So on the left, from left to right, we have tropical cyclone Yazi from January 2011, um, Aita from April 2014, and Marsha from February 2015. <coughs> Um, so, in order to simulate these three cases, we're using the Weather Research and Forecasting Model, WARF for short, uh, version 341, uh, which is developed and maintained by the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Um, it's a mesoscale numerical weather prediction system, which is commonly used for both atmospheric research and operational forecasting. It has two dynamical cores. One is mainly for um, idealized forecasts and uh, or idealized systems. And the other is for real data cases. And that's called Advanced Research WARF and is the system that I use. Um, so WARF is a fully compressible, uh, has fully compressible non-hydrostatic equations um, and it's terrain following. And it's on a staggered grid, which means that um, variables such as U and V winds are recorded at the boundaries of grid cells. Um, but variables such as temperature and pressure are actually recorded in the center of grid cells. Um, it is also has flux conservation, which means that uh, essentially flux is multiplied by velocity. Uh, for more information, I would direct you to the WARF website. Um, so for our methods, we essentially have three different um, model setups, three different domain setups, uh, but they all three have um, two domains, so an outer domain with a coarse, more coarse resolution and an inner nested domain which has a higher resolution, um, but the inner domain is fixed, it doesn't move. Um, and they do vary, essentially the shape and extent of the domain varies case to case, um, which is mostly based on uh, the track of the case study and also the available initial condition data. So just taking one as an example, so this was for Yazi. So it has two domains. The horizontal grid spacing of the outer is 36 kilometers and the inner is 12 kilometer resolution. Um, uh, just as an example, um, 
the outer domain covers uh, about 5,000 um, kilometers and about 9,500 kilometers, and the inner domain covers um, around 3,000 and 6,000 kilometers. So we have 36 vertical levels, and the simulation length is only um, about three to five days, so that depends on the case. So we're mostly interested in the main intensification period of the tropical cyclone and um, landfall, which is why it's, they're quite short, these simulations. Mm -hmm. So even at the resolution of 12 kilometers, we do need to use a number of physical parameterizations to capture uh, processes that um, are occurring sub-grid scale. So that would be things like clouds, um, convection, all happening on the scale of meters to maybe one to two kilometers. Um, so I just laid um, out here what schemes we're using in case you're interested. Uh, we have carried out a large number of physics sensitivity testing um, for simulating uh, Australian case study tropical cyclones. And this was kind of our best, uh, best fit um, for accurately simulating tropical cyclone Yazi. Um, Yep, and so it was best in terms, especially in terms of uh, getting translation speed right and intensity. Um, one thing to note, we are using a cumulus parameterization and simulations can be very sensitive to this. Um, we're using a scheme, uh, the Cambridge scheme, which has somewhat less shallow convection over tropical oceans, which this definitely encompasses, but in some ways that is quite good for tropical cyclone simulation because it doesn't suppress deep convection, which is really important. We're also using a method of digital filter initialization. Um, okay. So for a limited area regional model, you need boundary conditions uh, fed into all sides of your domain. Uh, we're using error interim uh, reanalysis data so that's a global gridded atmospheric uh, reanalysis data at 0.7 degree resolution. It has a service level and then 37 vertical levels. It's available globally from 1979 to present, um, and it is a commonly used tool. But for our initial conditions, which are very important for a tropical cyclone or a short term simulation of any kind, um, we're using actually data from the Australian Community Climate and Earth System Simulator access uh, model, and especially the version which, is, um, which has been uh, designed for tropical cyclone simulation, so that's access TC. And this data is courtesy of North Davidson, and it's been really uh, influential for us because its resolution is 0 um, 11 degrees in spatial resolution, which is much higher than the error interim. So we typically use um, this initialization at the initialization time step, just the first time step, and then the error interim provides the boundary conditions thereafter. Um, just to give you an idea of the difference between those two data sets, so here we're looking at minimum sea level pressure um, for both data sets, so error interim on the left and access TC on the right uh, for the initialization time of tropical cyclone Yazi. Um, so red colors are higher pressure, blue colors are lower pressure, and if you remember, tropical cyclone is a low pressure system. So you can clearly see uh, much more highly defined blue colors in the access TC. So the resolution of that um, data is able to capture the structure and intensity of a tropical cyclone, um, which is largely missing from the error interim data you'd be hard pressed to say that there was a tropical cyclone in the um, domain at all. Um, so using this data set uh, definitely improves our, res our um, simulation overall of the cases. And so by using this initialization technique, what we're essentially doing is seeding an accurate um, tropical cyclone vortex that represents the case study into the simulation. Okay, so moving on to our methodology of how we simulate a future climate. So I just want to explain in case um, anyone isn't sure, but global climate models simulate future climate following um, what has been designated as future predictions of 
greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. And we have several different scenarios um, and they're known as uh, represent, re representative concentration pathways. And there are several different ones depending on how we do with emissions. Um, so these range from we're doing really well, we've cut emissions to zero. So that's RCP 2.6 and those go up to RCP 8.5, which is our business as usual um, emission standard. And though it's maybe the most extreme scenario, we do actually look like we're following that path right now. So what we've done is we've essentially simulated the three case studies in two climate scenarios. So first is a current climate um, where we, the boundary conditions are provided by the error interim that I've described to you uh, of the date that the actual tropical cyclone occurred and model CO2 is set to 379 parts per million. And then we have a future climate scenario, which is that same error interim uh, boundary conditions, but with a climate change delta added to it. And model CO2 is set to 935 parts per million. So how we've calculated this climate change delta is by subtracting um, the current climate that's simulated by the model, the community earth system model, and we subtract that from the future climate that is simulated by the CESM model. So what we designate as the future climate is um, the monthly average of 30 years of data that's simulated by the community earth system model. So the RCP 8.5 scenario is what we're taking. And the current climate is designated to be the monthly average of the CESM um, simulations from 1976 to 2005 and that's their 20th century simulation run, so their current climate runs. The reason we take 30-year averages is to remove any um, signals of decadal variability. So just some caveats of this approach. Um, the climate change delta is only calculated from one realization of a future climate scenario from one model. So that's the community Earth system model, which is also developed and maintained by NCAR and just the RCP 8.5 scenario. So we don't, um, we don't really deal with um, variability of future climate. Um, however, it has been shown that CSM is a physically realistic model and that it does represent roughly a median um, in the ensemble spread for future climate scenarios. So this method also assumes that a tropical cyclone vortex is present and we're just assessing the response of that vortex to changes in the boundary conditions. So we're not addressing the likelihood that the vortex occurred, so we're not addressing genesis, um, likelihood or frequency in the future climate. <laughs> To give you an idea of what this climate change delta looks like, here we're looking at sea surface temperature um, from a January delta that would be added to January cases. So we see warming, as you might expect, um, on the order of two degrees Kelvin, but up to three and a half degrees Kelvin. Um, so this additional thermal energy, um, you might um, then expect to see more intense tropical cyclones. But there's also a change to the structure of the sea surface temperature, where in some cases you see greater warming than others. Um, and the structure of change is very important because when you have gradients of sea surface temperature, they can actually act to stretch uh, vortexes and lead to uh, greater intensifications of tropical cyclones. So here we're looking, if you can see, um, is the delta of the 500 millibar wind. So that's roughly the change to the steering flow in the environment in a January uh, case. So the change is on the order of one to three knots, uh, which is relatively small, but could definitely act to steer um, a tropical cyclone. All right, so here we're looking at a vertical profile. So uh, if you can see this black line represents the temperature of the air from the surface um, aloft in the atmosphere. And the blue line represents the dew point temperature, which is representing relative humidity of the atmosphere. So that again, that's from the surface aloft. So these solid lines are for the current climate. And the way we've got that is we've averaged the whole domain, uh, the, the 
the atmosphere of the whole domain to create these lines. And this is at the beginning of a simulation. So again, the solid, the solid line is for current climate. And then this blue dotted line is the dew point temperature in the future climate. And the dotted line in the black is the, the air temperature of the future climate. So what I want you to notice from that is that both uh, of the dotted lines have shifted to warmer temperatures. So the surface is now over 30 degrees C. Um, so what's, that's it telling us that the atmosphere is both warmer and more moist in the future environment. Uh, this, this red dashed line here and the area under the curve is representing um, convective available potential energy in the current climate. And this one here and the area under it is the convective available potential energy in the future. So what I want you to take from that is that the convective available potential energy in the future is much larger and convective inhibition is much smaller. And so it's just as it sounds that um, stronger convection is more likely to occur and it can occur more easily. So again, we might expect to see uh, more intense tropical cyclones more easily able to develop. I will touch quickly on some computational aspects. Um, so WARF can run on a huge host of different systems. Um, if you're interested in that, I would direct you towards um, the WARF website. For me personally, I run on NCAR's supercomputer called Yellowstone. I believe it's housed in Wyoming. Um, and my specific build of WARF, I use an Intel compiler, um, DMPOB build, and for a simulation, a full simulation, I always request exclusive nodes and 16 tasks per node. And in case you're interested, um, a simulation with a setup that I told you about today, so there's 36 kilometer resolution on the outer domain, 12 in the inner, and for a five day simulation takes around three to four hours of wall clock time. And there is some variation in that, and that's sensitive to things like the time step that I choose for the model and the actual specific physical parameterizations. Uh, some of them are more complex, so it takes longer. As I'm sure you're aware, um, increasing vertical or horizontal resolution or adding any complexity like coupling to an ocean model or adding atmospheric chemistry can dramatically increase computation time. So, Given that um, we have an accurate representation of tropical cyclones um, in terms of trajectory and structure and intensity uh, with the setup that I've described today, we've opted not to um, increase resolution or uh, increase, in, increase complexity in any way. Um, but uh, many people have asked me through my PhD, um, what would you do without computational limitations? So. If I didn't have any limitations in terms of wall clock time, but also if simulations ran quicker, I certainly would increase the resolution of my tropical segment simulations. I would capture probably greater intensity um, structure, especially in terms of the eye wall. Um, I would simulate a larger number of case studies, um, and I would consider using an ensemble of forcing models or concentration pathways as boundary conditions. Like I said, I'm only using one as it is. And there's also a personal time limit in terms of um, uh, writing scripts to automate these things, but also post-processing post and analysis of, you know, potentially exponentially more simulations. Um, storage is also a large issue for me. Um, WARF output files are large. Even with the set setup that I have, each file is about 40 gigs, but if you increase to four kilometer resolution, we'd easily be adding each file of 90 gigs. So um, that's definitely something you have to consider. Okay, moving on to the juice. Um, so th these are some of the highlights of our results of these current climate versus future climate simulations. I'll start with intensity. Um, so here we're looking at tropical cyclone Yazi, and we're looking at the minimum sea level pressure in red and the maximum wind speed in knots uh, in blue recorded at each time step through the simulation of tropical cyclone Yazi. So the solid line is the current climate and the dotted line is the future climate. 
So what we're seeing is a tendency towards um, lower central pressure values, um, which actually indicates a more intense system as tropical cyclones are low pressure systems. So we're seeing changes on the order of 10 hectopascals, and that's actually quite large, especially um, later in the life cycle towards landfall. We're seeing trends towards uh, higher wind speeds. Uh, the change is actually on the order of about a 15% um, increase from current climate, uh, which is definitely important in terms of thinking about uh, damage and that kind of thing. Uh, so when we look across all three of our cases, we do see those same trends. Uh, we see trends towards um, lower central pressures, so that's with the dotted lines in the future, uh, lower central pressures, and higher wind speeds, uh, again up to about 15% higher. Uh, what's interesting with Marsha is that after landfall, actually, the percentage increase in wind speed was 30 to 40%. Um, so this also might be very important in terms of thinking about uh, destructive winds over land surface areas. We have tried to test whether the change that we're seeing to characteristics such as intensity are really a response to the boundary condition change or they're just a response to model internal variability. So if you change something in the model, um, you're going to get different results. So what we've done is we've simulated um, Yazi in uh, the current climate and the future climate, but three times for each with a slightly different initial condition. Um, so the way we've created initial conditions is that we've conducted the digital filter initialization um, for three different lengths of time. So one hour, two hours, three hours, and that produces a slightly different initial condition field. Um, and then we go ahead and run the simulation. So the solid lines are all three of the current climate, the dotted lines are all three of the future climate. And you can clearly see a separation um, of the groupings. So the response of a more intense system really is truly uh, a response to the change in the boundary condition, and it's not just model internal variability. Okay, so moving on to size. Um, so here we're looking at tropical cyclone Marsha. And red, we have again the minimum sea level pressure. But in green, now we're looking at the average radius of the 34 knot winds. So that's um, really giving us an indication of the size of the tropical cyclone and the size of um, destructive winds or tropical cyclone force winds. So what's interesting is that uh, the dashed line is future. So we actually see quite a large increase in the size of this tropical cyclone. And actually, on average, that's a 40% increase. So if you think about um, that means that 40% you know, more of the Great Barrier Reef or 40% more of the coastline um, is affected um, by, a tropical, by this tropical cyclone in, in the future climate. However, when we look across the other two case studies, we didn't uh, see that same pattern. So with Yazi, we almost saw no discernible change to size. Uh, and with ITER, in fact, um, it looks like the size decreases towards landfall. So that's this dashed line here. Uh, we're seeing a decrease in size. And so we thought about the reason why um, Marsha might be responding so strongly in terms of size. Um, it is the smallest uh, storm that we've simulated. It's also the weakest, which you can tell from the sea level pressure. Um, so given the climate change delta that's added to it, um, the delta of the wind speed is actually very large compared to the speed of the, of the vortex itself. And so its response to the climate change forcing is actually larger than um, the two other systems where their vorticity is already much stronger. So if we move on to trajectory, so you, if you can see, um, this is tropical cyclone Yazi. The solid line is the current climate. The dotted line is the future climate. There's a very slight shift um, of the trajectory southwards, uh, poleward. Um, but it is a pretty small uh, change. Um, but we do expect that that is to do with the delta um, that we added to the steering flow. Um, I brought this up earlier, but this 
the changes of on the order of one to three knots and I, I, if you can see the vectors um, they would be leading to a more poleward um, trajectory of the system. Uh, with Marsha, so solid is current, dotted is future, we see a slightly more distinctive shift in the trajectory. Um, so that's, it's, it's tracking slightly southward and for slightly even equator with. And again, we would expect that with the delta of the steering flow, um, but it also might be the case that because the tropical cyclone got so much larger, um, there would be a larger effect of the beta drift. So that's when you have a larger, more intense system, um, it has a greater tendency to drift poleward, um, given the beta effect. Um, I had definitely bucked this trend. Um, we saw something we didn't quite expect in that in the future scenario, uh, the track actually diverted somewhat equatorward, um, quite substantially. And we can explain this uh, in two ways. Um, first of all, I'm bringing back this size plot. So this was the average radius of 34 knot winds. So the size seems to be decreasing towards landfall in the future climate. And that would reduce um, the beta effect. So actually the storm would have less of a tendency to uh, drift uh, poleward. But also interestingly, so ISO was in April of 2014 which means that we add an April delta to it. And actually in the April delta, we see quite a different um, delta in the steering flow winds. So again, this is a vector of the difference to the steering flow winds. I don't know if you can see, but um, the tendency, uh, the direction of motion is definitely uh, equatorward and eastward. So we actually think that this uh, change to the steering flow um, could definitely have caused the change in the track that we're seeing. Um, so the final characteristic that we're going to look at is precipitation. Um, so here we're looking at the maximum precipitation that's recorded in a 480 by 480 box around the eye of the tropical cyclone at every time step. And so the maximum would be uh, selecting the most intense quadrant of the tropical cyclone. We also look at the average um, precipitation in that same box around the eye. So that would actually be um, accounting for all four quadrants of the tropical cyclone. So again, so that's in blue. So that again, solid line is current, uh, dashed line is future. For both measures, we see an increase. Um, average precipitation increases on average um, about 30 to 35 percent. Um, Maximum precipitation actually increases more than that. Uh, we're seeing increases on the order of 45, on average 45%. But at certain time steps, that increase can be much larger. Looking across all three, uh, in Yazi, we do see that same tendency towards increased precipitation in the future. It might be somewhat more muted, but the average is increasing up to 25%. The maximum is increasing up to 60% at certain time steps as well. Eater again doesn't quite do the same thing. It actually decreases in precipitation. And we need to look into this a little further, but could definitely be explained by the smaller size of a tropical cyclone. OK, so what did we find? So what are the conclusions? Um, across all three case studies, we consistently found a decrease in central pressure around 10 hectopascals. Um, and an increase in wind speed around 15% um, to 30%. And so this is definitely indicating an increase in intensity. Two of our systems, so Yazi and Marsha, um, increased in precipitation, both in terms of average by 25 to 30%, and maximum values were increasing 45 to 60%. And we did find this both along the track, so over the open ocean, but also at the coastline, uh, which would lead to flooding potential problems. We did see with those two systems, um, poleward and slightly eastward shifts in the trajectory. We did, however, see some uh, anomalies, I guess. Um, so our smallest and weakest storm, Marsha, was the one that increased in size and quite dramatically by 40%. Uh, the most northerly storm and the storm that occurred latest in the season, Ita, shifted equatorward 
and it actually also increased in translation speed um, by about 25%, which we didn't see in the other systems. So with those conclusions, I just want to bring this back um, quickly. So we talked about how potentially if tropical cyclone characteristics changed in the future, we might see exacerbated um, effects to reef environments. So what do our findings suggest? An increase in intensity and wind speed would definitely increase mechanical damage. So that's the physical breakage of corals and also mixing in the water column. Increased precipitation over the ocean would reduce salinity, uh, but increased at the coastline or on, on the land itself would increase flooding, runoff and nutrient and sediment loading. Any increases in size uh, would lead to a large, larger area affected. Um, trajectory shifts would uh, lead to a different area being affected and potentially even areas that are currently unaffected in the current climate regime. Um, any changes to translation speed can actually alter uh, storm surge experienced over the land and therefore the coastal flooding and receding floodwaters. What is important is that um, we didn't find a uniform response of all tropical cyclone characteristics of climate change. So there's not a one size fits all, one blanket change that's going to happen to tropical cyclone characteristics. We did find sensitivity to the time of year of the tropical cyclone, uh, the latitude at which it starts, and also the size and intensity of the starting system. Um, so this definitely speaks to the importance of a case study approach, but also uh, suggests we need to uh, simulate a much larger number of case studies to really find what's the trend and what are the anomalies of the response to climate change. So I will leave it there and hopefully have time for a few questions. <laughs>